Okay, so we're uh, we're now live and uh, broadcasting on Google Hangout. This is an exciting moment for all of us. At least it is for me. Um, and so I, I thought what we'd do is um, uh, talk about teaching the history harvest. But, but before we do that, because Dan Cohen is here with us from uh, the Digital Public Library of America, DPLA, we, uh, we're going to invite Dan to start and maybe give an update on DPLA and on how the history harvest might uh, connect with uh, DPLA. And so, uh, so if there's questions as, as Dan goes along, then go ahead and, and raise them. But then after Dan and we talk, after we talk about DPLA, uh, Scott, maybe we'll turn to you next, and then uh, uh, and then Andrew to you, and, and 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 see where the conversation goes about teaching how we've been teaching it in different places, and just to compare how we've how we've approached it. So, uh, but Dan, I'm going to uh, turn it over to you for a little bit. Great. Great. Well, thanks, so, thanks so much. It's great, it's to, great to be on this podcast. And I'm wearing my executive director, director of the LA. LA. I'm launching, launching the Roads Kayak, Kayak, Kayak Road now. Um, um, so, so uh, you know, what I want to say about the partners and the legislators of the LA is that we're really looking for ways to expand um, the realm of openly available materials and particularly cultural heritage materials. And so we really see collaborating with History Harvest and projects like it as I think a really terrific way to um, really enlarge the circle of historical documents and we're really excited about what's going on in, in the program. I hope we will have a formal, formal partnership um, and, and uh, one that expands across the country in the near future. Um, you know I think DPLA is all about providing open access to um, really unique historical materials. We're going to launch uh, a week from today with about 2.5 million items from places like the Smithsonian and the National Archives. But I think what really is exciting for us and for me as executive director is that um, the really great stuff is all from smaller local history projects, projects that bring online completely unique materials that have been scanned at the local level. Um, I've been doing a lot of interviews this week and showing some of what's already in the collection and uh, you know it just includes everything from baseball home movies from the 19 teens some of the earliest known footage that we have um, to uh, incredible material culture um, knitted sweaters from the 30s and and uh, and then of course uh, large-scale scan documents and books and so um, and artwork and all forms of human expression and so I think um, bringing online and partnering with um, History Harvest just seems to me to be a perfect fit um, because it really will provide us a way to um, to really you know bring online so much more of America's content. So, that's what I've got to say, and uh, I'll, I'll listen in for a few more minutes, and then I'll apologize for hopping off. That's great, Dan. Thanks very much. So uh, why don't we why don't we also introduce ourselves here? Um, I'm Will Thomas, and um, and uh, uh, and go ahead. Yeah, I'm Patrick Jones. I'm an associate professor of history and ethnic studies uh, here at UNL, uh, and I do modern U.S. history and African American studies. And I'm co-director with Will of the History Harvest Project. I'm Brandon Locke. I'm a master's student here at UNL, um, doing modern American history. And I'm also a project manager of the history office. So, um, and Dan, do you um, do you want to talk a little bit about the launch uh, uh, next week? Just to inform everybody of, of what's going on. Uh, sure. Uh, um, the the launch which will be at the Boston Public Library. Will um, it will be a gala? It will be a festivity, but it will also be um, a chance to, I think, highlight some of these resources and some of the projects that we're collaborating with. So, uh, Will, I think you'll be there. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. All of you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. So we'll so have, we'll have an exhibition room that will include a number of projects. Um, some of them content projects, content acquisition projects like History Harvest. Other ones that will explore copyright and legal issues related to. 
um, how we might expand uh, the set of publicly available materials. Um, and then we'll have new ways to kind of visualize and knit together materials. So we'll have some projects that look a lot like the kinds of projects uh, folks are, are now seeing coming out of um, digital history and digital humanities where there are really innovative and creative ways of, of uh, putting together materials for research purposes, for reading purposes, for pedagogical purposes. So that will all be available at the launch. Um, and you know, for folks watching this on the live stream, there will be, in fact, a live stream of the DPLA launch that you can watch from wherever you are uh, next Thursday evening. Well, great. Right. great. Right. Thanks, Dan. Um, OK. OK. So, so I think so I'm going to sign off. off. Sorry to drop in and out of this Hangout, but it's great to see everyone. And uh, look forward to seeing a few of you in Boston in a week. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great. Take great. care. Take care. Those who are, uh, who are participating in the in the stream, watching this or uh, uh, chatting, you're welcome to add questions whenever you like, or to uh, raise a question through the chat box, and we'll we'll try to field it. Um, you can always uh, send one of us an email as well. We'll pick it up. But um, but what, we're going to turn to to Scott uh, French, and I'd, you know, love to hear. What what you all have been doing in Florida and, and just how you've been uh, approaching the history harvest, it's, it's a little different. I think we have three different kind of models here between what happened in, in Virginia and what happened in Florida and what's happening here. So, uh, so Scott, why don't you just have at it, tell us what you've been doing, and then we'll uh, pick it up from there. Great. Great. Uh, thank you. It's great to be part of this, and we're really excited to um, – to think about this as a, a national movement. Um, we are uh, working, the, the context here is that we have an MA program in public history, an MA track, and it's, it's also connected to a very robust public history uh, set of projects called Riches, which is a regional initiative for collecting the history experience and experiences and stories of Central Florida. And we have a an archive uh, a system for collecting the material and, and making it accessible and searchable. So a lot of the infrastructure is in place, but what we had not done was to reach out to the community and, um, you know, ask them to contribute um, in this way. And so we decided that we would have a two-part semester project that would involve two graduate seminars. In the fall, my colleague Rose Byler, who directs the public history program, taught her public history, her class, as a planning class, um, thinking about all the issues of marketing, the logistics, um, the history of the particular topic. And our topic was a building. We have the luxury of, of uh, working out of a historic building, uh, which was a school uh, in Sanford, Florida. The University of Central Florida has an arrangement with the county to uh, take over the school property and develop a public history center. So our first history harvest was to collect the history of the school, of the building. That gave us a very a nice focus. And a lot of people have a real attachment to that place. And so building on the plans that the students developed in the fall semester, my class, which you can see here around me, they're at, here at the table, we meet every week at this hour, so this worked out beautifully. Um, we actually conducted the history harvest. We uh, implemented uh, a lot of the ideas that were developed in the fall, but we had to really adapt ourselves and, and do a lot of things that we didn't anticipate. You know, there are all kinds of, you know, contingencies and so this group was actually charged with running the history harvest. I think one of the twists that we have as well is that we partnered with a local business that conducts large-scale personal scanning events. And one of the reasons we wanted to do that was we thought we could learn from them how they manage the process of collecting uh, materials that are very valuable to their owners. How do they keep track of everything that they're, that's coming through the door. And they have a really interesting system of using barcodes. And we wanted to take advantage of watching them. How do you, how do you run these scanning events? 
Now, they don't think about community history or the larger sort of cultural and social history that we're interested in. They're very much about serving individuals and helping individuals tell personal stories. So there were some really interesting conversations around that. And I think it created an interesting dynamic to see how our interests intersected with what they do and in some ways diverged from what they do. So I'll leave it there. We're actually, we completed our harvest. It was, it was successful. We got a lot of great publicity. Since then, we've been involved with collecting, ad adding the metadata to the objects, and, and we're about to upload a lot of that to uh, our Rich's MI uh, Mecca uh, database. We're also building a physical exhibit that will be unveiled in a week, and we were working on that today. So, so there are a lot of different aspects to what we're doing, but it's been a great graduate student project. We haven't thought a lot about how to bring this to undergraduates, um, so I'm really excited to hear. And, and I should mention that Patrick Jones, we were really grateful to you, Patrick, for Skyping in and, and giving us the benefit of your experience. We learned a lot from, from what you had to tell us and share with us during that Skype conversation earlier this semester. But I'm going to stop there. Okay, um, so that's it. That's exciting. I mean, a lot of things uh, uh, to talk about there. Um, do you all, so let's see, let's turn to uh, uh, Andrew uh, Whitmer uh, next and, and hear what's what's been going on in Virginia. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm glad to be part of this. It's very exciting. I teach at James Madison University in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And I implemented the History Harvest as part of an undergraduate class, um, a 300 level history major class um, on US religious history. So I'm always looking for good digital projects to drop into my courses. And this was a, a relatively large class compared to uh, the other classes that it sounds like uh, you all have used the Harvest with. Uh, this was a class of about 30 students and uh, a broad survey of U.S. history. So we were doing many other things in the class. Uh, we had other papers, other exams, regular lectures. It was a thematically organized survey of U.S. history. And the history harvest for us was one rather large component of the class, but just one, one component. The class wasn't organized uh, around the harvest. So that raised um, a certain number of challenges. Um, one of the challenges was just resources, technological resources. Uh, technological expertise and collecting expertise, knowledge of how to handle uh, the documents that were donated and, um, and then how to process them and where they were going to wind up. So we addressed that um, by collaborating with uh, the Special Collections Library at James Madison and then by working with uh, the Center for Instructional Technology, which is um, at JMU to support faculty who are engaged in uh, technologically um, oriented projects. And they help to train the students on how to use all of the scanners and, and uh, photographic equipment. And then um, provided uh, server space to host um, on the Special Collections website all of the documents that we created and scanned. Um, so one of the ways that uh, it was a lot to do in one semester, um, in addition to everything else that we were doing in the course, one of the ways that uh, we dealt with that organizationally was to divide the 30 students in the class into separate committees. Um, one of the committees was event planning, so we scheduled our harvest on a Saturday late in the semester. It was a four-hour event, probably didn't need to be four hours long, it could have been two hours uh, successfully. And um, another committee was uh, in charge of researching all of the, the legal uh, ramifications of what we were doing, making sure we had the right permissions forms. Um, another committee trained on the technology and was responsible for leading the other students in that area. And then most of the students um, were uh, tasked with outreach. Uh, we decided to target religious history in the Shenandoah Valley since religious history was the theme of the course. And uh, the students, we divided uh, the outreach committees uh, according to the four counties surrounding Harrisonburg. Um, one of the takeaways from the project was that we could have targeted a much smaller region. Uh, we could have just stayed within the city of Harrisonburg and found plenty of material. And then uh, over the course of the semester, there were regular check-ins as the committees uh, produced action plans 
and shared those with the rest of the class and then came back on a regular basis to, to update all of us during class about uh, the progress that they were making, the challenges that they were running into. And those were very good times where we could uh, do this collaboratively, bat around ideas, problem solve together. Um, I, I think one of the real payoffs um, of, of the project was giving students the chance to plan this largely on their own. Um, I first heard about the idea from, uh, I think I was, was on Will's blog, and, um, and then saw some of the media coverage of the harvest that Patrick and Will organized in Nebraska. So at the beginning of the course, I gave a, a brief description of what a history harvest might be, how it had been run at Nebraska, played those radio, public radio pieces uh, for the students, and then we um, essentially turned it over to them um, and developed what our model was going to look like together, which was very successful. It was very exciting for the students to know that this was going to be something that they were organizing and conceptualizing largely on their own, uh, not something that I came up with and then um, they only implemented. Um, so there's, there's a lot more that I could say about what we did. Um, we had a successful event. Um, we collected over 8,000 individual scans, um, most of which have already been put up on the JMU website, some of which uh, Special Collections is still processing. And we collected all of that material with only about eight individual donors. Um, so for us, one of the, the takeaways from the event was that you can have a successful event um, without having a large crowd of people there. Um, and uh, much of what we collected, we knew before the event was, was going to show up that day. Um, so that's another, I, I think, helpful tip for people. Uh, when I was talking with Will before I started this, this project, he told me, raise the harvest, uh, raise the crop before you stage the harvest. And uh, that was a very important piece of advice um, because in preparing for the harvest, one of the outreach committees made contact with a, a local uh, Seventh-day Adventist academy who had something like 18 banker's boxes filled with documents sitting in their vault that had been neglected for years. So we knew before we even had the, the harvest um, that that stuff was coming, and that was the largest uh, single acquisition. Andrew, thanks. Thanks very much. That, that was, that's great. Um, thanks, thanks. 8,000 uh, 8, individual scans. Uh, that's, that's impressive. <laughs> uh, some of them we were able, able to, uh, to uh, process on the day of the event. Um, and then some of it we were able to secure per permission to just retain the um, hard copies and work through it as we had time. Um, so uh, what, what, what should, what, maybe Patrick, do you want to talk about what we've done, share what we've done, and maybe Ali can, can uh, uh, join uh, Patrick in that, in that effort? Sure. Um, well, we had done two harvests prior to having a class that was connected um, with their History Harvest project, so standalone events. And we were also, I was the undergrad chair at the time. Will uh, had recently come on as our new chair, and we were engaged in a uh, broad conversation in our department also about our undergraduate major, about what a history major uh, could and should look like in the 21st century, given new challenges to the humanities, given the realities of uh, digital technology um, and its impact on, on everything, including the university um, and, and everything that we do, from our research to our teaching and learning um, here. And so we were looking for uh, new approaches to history, innovative ways to give students in particular uh, what some call authentic learning opportunities and experiences, uh, more hands-on, um, uh, community-oriented, collaborative um, uh, opportunities for our students. And out of that uh, came the History Harvest. Um, uh, we then, after doing two standalone harvests, uh, decided to attempt to put a class together around it. We had as I think many universities do, an internship class that was uh, not fully developed and it was kind of on the books and it would be used if a student had an idea and would come and talk to us. So 
at, at first, that we used that as the vehicle to create a class. And I had uh, eight students working uh, with me on that class. We focused on the, the African American community in North Omaha. I, I live in Omaha, um, and I do African American studies, so I'm very active in the community there. Um, and so uh, these eight students joined me, and as I told them the first day, this was kind of new. We were creating this out of uh, you know, kind of whole cloth, and that we were all stepping off the cliff together, and uh, that it was experimental, and that, that we were partners in this, this project. And uh, it was really a, overall a wonderful experience. Now we had, um, and we were very aware of some of the built-in challenges that we had um, facing us uh, dealing with the, the African American community, a community that has uh, skepticism in some ways of us as a, as a university, um, uh, you know, as a large uh, state institution, uh, you know, again, kind of a, there's a town gown and, and UNL, there's a, there's a UNO um, in Omaha, and UNL, though we're the flagship, doesn't have uh, the full kind of presence in Omaha that it could, and I, as someone who lives there, I have an interest in increasing um, that, but, you know, we also have a community that has had, um, you know, cultural theft, uh, and there was a lot of question for us about who are you? I mean, I'm a white guy that does race. Our students were large, were overwhelmingly white, um, uh, too, and so we had to kind of think that through and think about how we would approach the community, how we would tell them about this project, and how we would uh, uh, encourage them uh, and invite them uh, to participate. Um, so we did a lot of work uh, educationally in the classroom. We started with a kind of mix of both some traditional in-classroom approaches to learning about the community. I, I can't stress enough uh, for folks out there thinking about doing this, how important it is to, to really be maximally respectful of the community. And that starts with knowing about the community and understanding the community. Um, and uh, at the same time, also immediately putting students out into the world and uh, trying to connect with the community and to make connections and to build up those relationships. I would echo what Andrew said in that, a seed, I would put it this way, it's really important to seed the project on the front end if you can. Um, uh, and we that was somewhat easy for us to do in Omaha because I work there often, I know a lot of people, but also there's a great uh, institution, the Great Plains Black History Museum is there. And uh, for a long time it was one of the only African American archives and museums west of the Mississippi and it's been deep Bumped for about 15 years, but I got involved two years ago, and the new director came on and, uh, and leading the effort to revitalize their archives. So we had uh, established, we had already had established that relationship, and we're able to work with them um, on the project. Not only in terms of uh, having them uh, allow us to digitize a sampling of some of their materials um, for for the project, uh, but also it gave our students a, a, another opportunity. We spent some time helping them uh, refurbish some of their archives and reorganize some of it. Some of the materials had been put in just a long, double-wide um, container on the property, not, not airtight or anything. Uh, some of those materials had been damaged, but we literally went over and spent a whole day, and we opened that up. It was like opening Al Capone's vault. We knew things were in there, but we had no idea what, and we uh, organized those things. Uh, we, um, uh, we took photographs of everything and inventoried all of those materials. That mater those materials now have been moved to a, a, a secure place. So we, in addition to the harvest, we also, that afforded us and the students some other opportunities to work hands-on with local materials. And I, I'm stressing that because I think, and may, maybe Ali can speak to this too, um, you know, our harvest happens kind of in October. It's kind of halfway through the semester. And while students get out into the community and in the harvest, I try to bring people from the community into the classroom and, and things like that. I mean, students really wanted to get at materials. And so that other relationship with the Great Plains Black History Museum uh, allowed us to be doing some work with materials prior to the harvest uh, as well. And to really give something back to the community in addition to the History Harvest Web Archive in terms of helping a local history institution uh, in this case, get back on its feet. Um, but I really think that this is a, another dynamic of the history harvest that I encourage people to do, which is partner with local organizations and institutions that are committed to um, history and to use the history harvest as a way to support them. Many of them struggle 
um, for acknowledgement uh, or to bring people in um, and to just let people know that they're there, um, and, and which generates resources and, and interest in their things. So I think the History Harvest is also a great opportunity through those partnerships to give local history institutions or public history um, uh, organizations uh, 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 some help along the way. Uh, and that also helps our project, too. But it's a really great offshoot from this. Um, there are many lessons you know, we had, had along uh, the way. I'd stress, again, the improvisational quality that we everybody needs to be prepared for, uh, the inevitable uh, things that come up that will get you off uh, your initial plan, no matter how well you, you put it together. We're dealing with communities. We're dealing with, with human beings. Uh, and and it's, it's their history. It's their community. It's their experience. It's their stories. Um, and so really respecting that and doing the hard work. We also, in terms of publicity, and I stressed this um, with folks in Florida when we talked, you know, we did a variety of things. We made posters and flyers. Uh, we did media, a variety of kind of uh, citywide and even statewide and then very localized, community-oriented media and things like that. But really, it's I think the degree that you're successful is largely determined by the degree to which you make real human contact with the community, and earl the earlier the better, so with individuals, with organizations. We partnered with several, and both the harvests that I've done in the classes, with local organizations who had a stake in this. They uh, uh, you know, were on our materials, so it allowed people in the community to see that we had the imprint through these partnerships with trusted local community uh, organizations and things like that as well. And it really helped us get over some of those barriers that we have, particularly doing a harvest in an in, in African-American community where there was a certain amount of skepticism. Um, uh, so I think th the more you can make local contact, and, and not just technological contact. A lot of times, particularly students, want to throw out an email, and that, that's it, or a phone call. And those are good, but I think face-to-face, -face, so taking the time and effort to line up a meeting and going and meeting with people, um, offering to come to some of their events and meetings if necessary, to come to them to explain to their constituency when necessary, even if it's after hours or on a weekend or something, about the project. But it really is the relationship aspect of it uh, that in my two times doing this now has been uh, really crucial to the success um, of, the, of the harvest uh, as, as well. I think I'll leave it uh, there right now. There's a whole lot of lessons um, that I've learned from doing doing uh, this that I'd love to share, but uh, I think I'll leave it there for now. Maybe, Allie, if you have any uh, thoughts from your experience from a student perspective. Uh, we, we also are, uh, have organized it as an undergraduate, an advanced undergraduate class. So uh, Allie uh, Bousquet is with us, and, and she was one of the students in that class, who's now gone on to, to graduate school in library. And information sciences. Yeah, um, I really would echo the personal connection aspect of it. Um, I mean, for me, taking the course, I really wanted hands on experience. And so, working with the Great Plains Black History Museum, um, it was good to get a grasp on what kind of materials we were going to be getting um, and also just how to handle the materials we were going to be getting. Um, but I think. Um, working with the museum that's in that community that's a little bit weary of UNL in general. Um, it was really helpful that face-to-face -face interaction we had. You know, we went out to lunch and like walked around the community that we were going to be working in and I think that really offered us um, some legitimacy that otherwise I think people would have been uh, more apprehensive to offer their materials to us and um, so I think that was something that was really important and that I definitely agree with, with Patrick. Um, and for me, it has been really helpful, um, you know, adding the metadata and that sort of thing to the items that we got has really helped me in my program now as a library science student. Like, I had no idea what metadata was before, because that's not something you learn in a traditional history class. Um, so for me, it was like real tangible skills that I earned, and I am a, I'm a big fan of the History Harvest. Um, yeah, I can answer any other questions, but that's all I have to say for right now. Maybe I can just jump in and add a little bit more on, on that. Well, that was one of the things that we wanted to, to give students was um, uh, what were these tangible skills, whether they're oral history skills, whether they're um, you know community outreach and media kinds of skills, or these the digital technology kinds of skills. So that was 
that's part of how we're trying to build our, our major up too. Um, one of the things I was going to say too is that uh, the question has come up, and I, I think I'm moving on this question. We've been doing this as largely, we have one history harvest in the kind of middle of the semester, and then we spend the remainder of our time processing some of those materials. Um, and for instance, uh, we, we focused on the African American community in North Omaha the first year I did it, and then this past year we were here in Lincoln and focused on refugee communities. We are a refugee relocation center, and so this is a range of people from a variety of backgrounds, um, but often who have had a traumatic experience in their life that has brought them here, uh, have seen great violence and war and, and things like that. Uh, both of these communities, for some different reasons, you know, were, there were barriers, there were challenges to, to overcome, and in both of these, at the actual harvest, we had a number of people that came just to check it out, and just to see us in action, to, to kind of see for themselves that we were legitimate, that we were genuine, that we, we were uh, a professional, that we truly respected the community and the materials that they were giving to us and things, and it, it made, it's, it's made me believe that I, if, instead of doing one history harvest, I know that if we had done more, we would have had more people come on the second and third history harvest because we got over that, that burden on the first one. And a lot of those people who came and saw what we were doing came away really excited about it, but they hadn't brought things with them that day. So they we invited them to follow up with us, and, and some people did connect with us or me personally to add some things. But you know, if we had had... Uh, say two or three of them, I think uh, in general they would build um, over some time, particularly when doing these harvests with a community like the refugee community here in Lincoln or the African American community in North Omaha. So I, I think I'm evolving to it, the idea of instead of one kind of major event, having uh, a series of harvests or more than one and, and maybe depending on what the theme is or the community they could be on the same day in different places, if that makes sense. In both of these communities, transportation issues were a part of it, people getting there. Uh, so thinking about when you do this and, and the communities uh, uh, that you're working with and their ability to get there. Many of the refugees work pretty much all the time. There is no weekend off. They're working nights. They're, that presented some challenges, too, and just when do we do this? And so having just one meant that a whole lot of people just couldn't come because of their practical reality. But if we had done more than one and had them, you know, one on a weekend, one on a weeknight, you know, some things like that. Um, we probably over time would have gotten a broader uh, array of people uh, engaged uh, in it as well. But these, that's a question that we're still thinking about. And again, is largely, uh, it might be determined by the, the harvest that you're doing, the community you're in, uh, or, uh, and working with the people or the place might determine how many or, you know, how you set it up. So again, you know, the improvisational quality, and, and I would put it this way too, uh, the flexibility of the history harvest uh, idea is something that I think is really positive about it too, that it can be adapted to different regions, to different approaches, to different kinds of communities, et cetera. It's not a rigid thing. Uh, but that, that's part of the responsibility of whoever's doing it too, is to think hard, to know the community well enough, to think through those things so that you can be as effective as possible. Um, so at this point, I mean, if, if uh, yeah, if anybody's uh, out on the chat line, just go ahead and fire questions whenever you'd like. Uh, we, I think all of us would welcome those. Um, uh, we, Jason back to yeah, I mean, I think we can invite Jason to comment a little bit on uh, maybe what's going on at Stanford. I, I'd also say, um, for those of us on the video, uh, if you hit your mute button, then then the uh, uh, when you're not talking, that might help uh, help our video. So, uh, Jason, why don't you uh, talk a little bit about what's happening at Stanford? Sure. Um, you can hear me, okay? Um, so I was I was brought out here. I'm an academic technology specialist, is my uh, title, and I have a position in the history department. And uh, Stanford, within the department, is interested in exploring, you know, different ways of doing digital history. And uh, my interest with History Harvest, um, in addition to ha ha having been a graduate student, 
at Nebraska and had participated in the first one in Lincoln, um, I'm interested in maybe trying to get something out here. Um, I know the department has an interest in doing much more with you know local history, uh, the history of Stanford, um, and trying to get you know students interested in these um, you know questions about the community and the, and the university they're at. You know, there's so much focus on on places like Google and Facebook um, that I think we sort of lose sense of you know the rest of the community and what was here before um, the valley became known for what it is today. Um, but I knew, you know, I, I, I would, I'm, I'm trying to encourage some faculty to, uh, to um, look into History Harvest as a thing they could do here. Um, you have me thinking about things I could do here um, as a, in a teaching capacity or something. Um, I mean, I'd love to do, you know, a Silicon Valley focused History Harvest, um, but maybe not from the perspective so much of technology, but, you know, this was all orchards and farmland here before the companies moved in. And, and it'd be interesting to, to reach out to that community of, of, you know, migrant farm workers and others that were here and tell a, a different story of, of the valley and, and maybe get a different perspective on um, this place that we're in. That's great. That's, that's great. Uh, Jason, thanks. Um, Scott, do you have, uh, do you want to lead off with some further comments and questions and, uh, or how would you like to proceed? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, um, well, I think, well, I think one of the one issues, of the issues uh, uh, we grappled with was, uh, this idea of partnering with the, uh, photo scanning business. Uh, for us, uh, there were a lot of positives in that going into it. One of the things was that they had access to uh, large-scale scanning events, which I wasn't even aware existed. Um, and, you know, so we, saw, we thought, well, there are a couple of things. We can learn how they do these events and the logistics of it and the management of the, of the digital assets on site. We also might have future access to some of the events that they run and that we could pitch our approach which is more about community history and um, you know contextualizing these personal materials and pitch that to an audience that doesn't come there for that purpose you know they're coming there to get their own photographs scanned so you know maybe we could get in on that and and sell ourselves and 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 our work to an audience that wouldn't otherwise know about us and our work. One of the things we gave up in partnering with them was that we, at first we thought, well, they're just going to let us borrow their equipment, that we can use the scanners and we can have a number more stations than we thought we would have. But it, they volunteered to actually do the scanning and we said, well, that might be good. We'll see how they do it and we did benefit, but we gave up the opportunity to do the scanning ourselves and I think some of the students expressed a sense of a lost opportunity that that was something they would lo have liked to have done. And I wondered how valuable that particular part of it is. Now, our students did enter metadata and they did process the images that were, were collected by the, the scanning company. Those were given back to us and we now are processing them for our own archive. But I wondered, in, just in terms of the scanning you know, component of a history harvest, how valuable that is. And I wondered if, if any of you could comment on that. Yeah. Well, why don't Patrick and I talk about a couple of yeah, responses. I, my, I would, I would uh, uh, note that one of the things I hoped that would happen at the history harvest on site um, would be uh, a conversation about the meaning of those materials uh, to the donors and to history broadly, to, to us, um, as scholars, as researchers, as teachers. And, um, and I think that, that, that uh, setting up that, that conversation uh, takes some practice and takes some intentional uh, decisions on the part of, of us, as if, if that's what we're interested in. And, that's certainly what we were interested in. And what I mean by that is, 
um, it's sometimes it's simple things like how uh, someone coming into the history harvest site, what is the layout of the site? Where it, where is the site taking? Where is the harvest taking place? Patrick's already mentioned that about the need for being in the community. But even there, the, I'm talking about the literally the floor layout of who's greeting people when they come in. What are they told when they come in? Then where do they go? Um, and at what point do you uh, want to have that that uh, conversation about the object and and hear the that that person's uh, that the donor's story about the the historical nature of what they're bestowing into the history harvest, what its meaning is for them, and I think that's um, you know some sometimes it's very simple things like. Uh, working with our students to uh, at the table where they're going to hear that story, not to interrupt the uh, <laughs> the the person, you know, not uh, to listen to the whole story, and then uh, and then begin to ask a series of questions. We had a series of questions we wanted them to ask, um, and uh, and uh, Patrick has refined that with the classes in different ways. But for us, I think, uh, Scott, having that conversation was a key part of the history harvest. So just collecting digital items was, was, was not, you know, I mean, that's part of the harvest, but it's also about the story and the meaning of those materials. And mm -hmm. so, Patrick, what did you want Yeah, to Yeah, I would just I, I would reaffirm that. Um, and maybe I'm not sure. I'd be interested to hear if either of the other two uh, 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 Scott or Andrew, if your classes did anything with oral history or collecting stories too, but we have, you know, we started to do that as just a way to get the story around the meaning and how the family came to it and things, and then we thought we'd use that uh, to fill in some of the metadata and description thing, but now we've moved to really using the oral histories, and, and we'll be doing more of that uh, going forward, so seeing the stories and that was particularly important for the refugee community, where a number of those folks didn't have a lot of material things um, from their home place um, because of the ways that they had to leave. But what they did have was their story, and they were very interested in sharing that. And, and particularly uh, because we were dealing with two communities, both the harvest I've done, who often don't feel a part of the bigger community, this kind of connectivity with us as the university, with students who are maybe not of the community but are very thrilled and energized about these histories was really wonderful in terms of crossing um, uh, lines of difference between us and that often keep us apart in the community. I mean, Ali can maybe speak to this. I, I do think doing it, whether it's being a greeter or sitting at a table and collecting the initial story or being a scanner or we've been digitally photographing things is really critical. One, in the skills development part of, of what we're trying to do with undergrads. Uh, two, uh, they want to do that stuff and they uh, like technology stuff too, so that's hands on. And it just feels like they're doing it, right? They're actually contributing. Um, to it, and and again, it's where you get the interactivity. I'll uh, I'll mention Ali. I'll probably embarrass Ali here, but we had a, a gentleman, Mr. Taylor, who brought in some materials. Uh, African American gentleman from his family uh, that dated back to slavery. A coin that uh, one of his relatives had, as a slave, kept with her, as well as her cup that she used. So amazing materials. You know, you don't see a lot of slave materials uh, like that, uh, too, particularly here in Nebraska. It was really awesome, and, and Ali uh, was a part of that uh, uh, interview when he sat down, Mr. Taylor, and I, I, I think she can uh, speak to how great that was to be a part of that conversation in the moment and to be interacting with Mr. Taylor. And then on the flip side, it was one of those moments where we realized we have to all contain our reaction as we're doing the interviews because it's one of the great things about the interview is you keep hearing Ali say things like, wow. wow. <laughs> you know, so I think she was blown away by the material that was brought in, um, too. And it was a you know, learning moment. Uh, and, and it's not just Ali. We had that on a lot of things where you could hear every uh-huh and mm and, and things like that. And, and so we've had to refine that a bit. But, but clearly that interactivity has been really critical. Now, on the flip side of that is that it's don't underestimate the need for students to practice 
on the technology, even on a scanner, um, but particularly if you're going to use a, a, a camera and digitize through a camera, because we have had um, you know some materials that we we uh, that were brought in and that you know we didn't quite get right on uh, whether it was the lighting or the clarity of the image and things like that. And so if you're going that route with students doing the work. Um, it's critical to right off the bat to know the skills of the students in there and whether you have the skills necessary to do that digitizing or if not uh, right off the bat either getting a set of students uh, in a subgroup uh, working on developing those skills so that by the time that the harvest happens they're ready to go and to do it right um, or to knowing yourself well enough to know we might have to partner with some other folks who have some of those um, skills because it really is a critical uh, to it and it, it, in doing everything else it can get lost in the shuffle um, uh, on that. Yeah, I yeah, think, I think uh, uh, we needed perhaps some oral history training that we weren't expecting something so cool to come in and I was paired with, um, I was an undergrad and I was paired with a graduate student and I think we were both just like so blown away, we didn't know what questions to ask. Um, so that could have been better. And I think also our technology, when we were doing the oral histories, we used um, the cameras we were using were picking up a lot of noise that wasn't the interview and that was kind of difficult too um, when we heard them played back. Um, and then I think it's important to have like the hands-on, like I personally didn't scan anything, but I was back there while one of my fellow students was scanning things, and it was really cool to see everything up close, and also to be like, oh, that's cool, like get this part of this picture, make sure we're like capturing everything that we want to be capturing. Um, so for us, I think it was really valuable to be part of like the intake in that sense. Um, but yeah some lessons on oral history or some practice would have been good. Students at our harvest uh, also participated in digitizing the materials and collecting some oral histories. Um, another thing that we did that worked out well was to invite um, a local historian of the Shenandoah Valley to do a 30-minute uh, talk for people who were there. Um, it, it worked well because it was our way of giving back to the people who had come um, and given to us. Um, and also just very practically, it gave them something to do while we worked with their documents. I also think that the scanning process is an opportunity to analyze the object in a new way. Um, I was just reading a blog by Mills Kelly um, about, it's called, Is Digitizing Historical Text a Bad Idea? Um, and he writes about the devil's Bible and the excitement that these students had when they came and saw it in person for the, for the first time. Um, they were kind of discussion, discussing what is lost when it's digitized. Um, I obviously think that you know the, the, the benefits far outweigh the, the negatives of, of digitizing. But I think it's a good opportunity for the students to take into consideration um, what is lost when you just have a photograph, whether it's the connection with the person who owns it, the context in which it it creates or even just, you know, the weight of it or, the, you know, the mass or, or anything like that that doesn't exactly transfer over to, a, you know, a collection of pixels. Um, so I think that even just that, that rote scanning is a good opportunity to analyze those objects in a, in a little different way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would chime in that I found um, that people wanted to talk with, with us um, about their their materials, they they they, uh, they wanted to understand more uh, the uh, significance or the uh, the, um, the importance of these materials, and they want that they 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 do want that scholarly um, connection with this material in a way to be explored or validated or um, assessed with them. And that, that part of the conversation is, uh, is equally exciting. Um, there's the sort of bestowal of, of an object, then there's also the, the discussion about what it means and why it's significant and why, why it's important to their family, but also why it's important to uh, a scholar of, of uh, 19th century America or 20th century America. I agree with that. I think it's it's kind of intimidating. Um, if 
one either professor or student doesn't happen to have expertise in that particular area. So as you're talking, I'm, it just occurs to me that maybe a good follow-up if, if the harvest would be scheduled early in the semester would be for students to uh, take responsibility for researching uh, the artifact or, or document that's donated and then getting back to following up with the donors with more information or context. I would just um, stress to another dynamic about these community conversations that we've been talking a lot about and that and it gets back to something we'll talk about earlier about the setup of the space um, and, and that is uh, you know we have kind of we've created a waiting area you know, we have an intake spot and then we have a spot where people do the oral history interview and then where we digitize materials and then but in the middle of all that we have an area with a lot of chairs, some refreshments, and things like that. And what we found is that that brought a whole lot of people together, people from the community that didn't normally interact, and then other people like us from the university or students, et cetera, who don't normally interact you know, with each other. And there were just really wonderful conversations that took place, not just from the individual that brought the materials and those of us working on the harvest, but among people in the community, talking to each other about their community, about their objects, and making connections that they didn't realize that they had, and they're living in the same space, you know, or we're at the same events, or, or their family was a part of it, or something like that. Mr. Taylor, who had brought the slave materials, was a longtime principal of one of the schools. Many people who were there wanted to talk to Mr. Taylor also, because he himself is kind of a historical artifact, and that many of them had him as a as a principal and a teacher and things and there were just all these wonderful conversations that took off and uh, you know creating the space in a way that encourages that and that waiting area was really important for us and then you know having some water and maybe some light refreshments um, I could see how having a, a community historian give a little talk or you know that kind of thing could also play into that um, as well but new things came of that interactivity that were beyond the, the specific objects that they brought in um, as well. Um, and I'd just say one more thing based on what Ali said in our model, which is, you know, undergrads uh, are in the class, they're organizing it, they're doing all the work, and then we do enlist other students, particularly grad students, on the day of the event, because we need some more labor, um, sometimes they help with the oral histories that got established skills and experience, they have a broader knowledge base and things like that, um, which is great and they've been wonderful. We have a wonderful pool of graduate students um, here. Um, though the danger is that those graduate students, whether consciously or, or not, kind of take it over in that day because of their experience or their greater knowledge of the subject or something like that. And, so it's important to just be aware of that and to, it was important for me as the teacher and us running the program to continue to have the undergrads who had done all the work to organize it and publicize it to also have the opportunity um, uh, and the responsibility for still being the lead on the actual day because the flip side of that is great disappointment <laughs> and kind of disillusion and you do all the work and then you don't get to really get the payoff which is being at the center of it during that day. So if, you, if you're going to work on a model like that and, and bring in other folks, whether it's other faculty or grad students, it's just important to be aware of that and to develop ways to make sure it, it doesn't. Because undergrads too can defer to the grad students or to faculty as well because they haven't done this before. Or they're aware that their knowledge or their skills are limited as well. And so as we all know in the classroom, you need to you know, kind of keep pushing them forward and, and giving them that responsibility. And in my experience, then they, they really take the responsibility. And one of the things they love about this that's different than other classes is that ownership um, that they have over the whole project, the doing of the, of the project. But since we have that split, I wanted to just get that out there for folks to consider. So we're, so we're, we're kind of closing in on our, on our hour uh, for this um, this uh, broadcast, and um, we've had a couple of questions from uh, different uh, interested folks. Uh, uh, Jackie Reed in Santa Barbara asking about um, what are the future plans, how, how can they get involved. Uh, Andy Mink at, at um, North Carolina is interested in, and his group is interested in, 
in getting involved as well. And, and I know others have, have expressed interest. And so, so we're kind of at the point where uh, we're trying to figure out how to um, create a structure what, to enable um, some, some federation of this material in some way. I mean, we all have, it's not all of us, but many of us have institutional uh, repositories or, or places where digital objects can be managed. But if we truly did this on a large scale, um, uh, as you heard from Dan Cohen, the idea with a partnership of, of history harvest sites would be for DPLA to be one of the repositories for digital objects. And I guess that's one question I had for both of you having done this. Is that something that you see as a, a positive development? And you know, how can we get others involved in this? Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, um, I, I, I'm really interested in that, and I think, uh, this is the idea that this material could be integrated back into the, into the teaching, right? That, that uh, the objects that are gathered could be uh, integrated, uh, the ones we gather here in Central Florida could be integrated with materials collected in other areas. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, how do we begin? I guess that's what I'm wondering. I can tell that you're thinking a lot, a lot, a lot about these issues, and we've been focusing very much on a regional scale, and so, we're enthusiastic about it, but I don't know that I have any idea of where how to raise this up to the national level. I'm anxious to hear what you are thinking about. Yeah, yeah, I like the idea of the national repository um, to to see if something larger emerges from uh, the accumulation of all of these uh, local locally gathered documents and histories. Um, one of the things that got my students really excited about the project was the sense that what they were doing was going to live beyond the class um, and was, was going to be drawn on by scholars, um, even would shape the way that our history understood its own past, our, our community understood its own history and its own past. Um, and we had occasion to talk about the way that, that histories are written and the way that uh, community histories are understood. And um, it gave a, a much a greater significance to the work that they were doing than uh, a, you know, an essay that would be graded and then returned and, and would die when the class ended. Um, so I think any, any movement um, to, to make these documents more widely available um, and to increase the number of people who are going to be able to access them and draw on them uh, would make collecting them even more uh, fruitful and exciting. Okay. Uh, did you want to close with anything? No, no. Just you know, one of the things we've been thinking about too is uh, just uh, other things we can do. And I hear Scott talking about uh, planning to do an exhibit out of the materials. We have, if you go to our Blitz Week materials, you can see a, a brief video that students made out of materials, um, and as well as a series of what we're calling History Harvest Minute, one minute audio. Uh, programs on specific artifacts that were brought in that then one of the local radio stations is, is going to be playing. Um, so as you're driving, you hear, you know, this week's History Harvest Minute. And, um, and so, uh, you know, just to be thinking too, uh, the more materials we have, and also with this national dynamic, the more interactivity we have, the more possibilities there are, whether it's online and creating interesting and unique collections across uh, time and space um, on themes or uh, types of materials. Um, or other or other types of, of outcomes. Uh, uh, one of the things we'd really like to do is to work with teachers um, also to build uh, curriculum uh, curricula out of, of these materials too. Uh, you know, to use them in our own teaching, um, but also at the K through 12 level too to to develop uh, uh, and to work with education schools and things like that. So lots of possibilities. You know, once we harvest these things, not just in making them available, but then it's unlimited what, what might be done with them, and that's really exciting to us, too, that new kind of value-added resources could be created um, from these materials as, as well as the web archive. Yeah. Um, well, I think we have, to, we have to wrap it up because we're, we're, uh, we're at four. We said we'd go to four, and oh, we're just past four. 
And I guess I would say that, um, Scott, in answer to your, your question, um, we're still trying to formulate what the, uh, uh, what the next uh, phase of this might be um, and to do it in a way that allows uh, uh, lots of different partnerships to develop. Um, I think it's it's great to do this at the local level and at the regional level, but uh, but at the same time, um, it, I think it would would benefit um, a large number of people if we were to uh, work to organize this and to uh, do it in a way that also um, for the field of history that develops uh, the kind of experiential learning, um, mo models of experiential learning that we want br more broadly in the, in the, uh, in the field, in the, in the curriculum. I mean, this is where it really started for us, was in a curricular question. Uh, and, you know, that has been a, a big driver of it. And I think if it's going to, if it's uh, going to, when I say get, get expand or become more national, that's an element of it as well, which is uh, um, spreading that kind of curricular model out into a wider number of institutions. Um, and that's going to take some organization, I think. It's going it's to take something beyond the local, beyond the regional um, level. So, uh, so uh, we will send you our ideas. I hope you will send us ideas. And um, uh, with that, thanks to everybody who's joined. Thank you. Uh, this has been helpful. It's been an enormous help to us to hear in detail what you've done at these other sites and in the way you've approached uh, the conceptualization of the project and the execution of the project as well with your classes. I've really learned a lot. So, uh, so thank you, and uh, we'll uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys. See you guys.